Hi, folks. My name is Irene Gallion. I'm a senior planner at CDJ's Community Development Department, and I'm here with what we're calling the Alternative Development Overlay District Refresher, uh, or ADOD. The ADOD is some code that's been being worked on for about four years, two planners in a pandemic, so you could be forgiven for not being able to track where it is. So we wanted to let you know why the ADOD was developed and what the code in front of you right now says. If you'll wait just a minute, I will share my screen, and let's get to it. Zoning is a set of rules on how land can be developed, and it impacts things like lot size, building size, and placement, and what sorts of activities can happen on that land. The point of zoning is to preserve property value and to separate incompatible uses. Since most of us common folk will develop our wealth from land ownership, and that wealth allows us to be a stable citizenry, the CBJ has a vested interest in facilitating stable land value. Nonetheless, about 916 residential structures in the downtown area were built before we even had zoning. We got zoning in 1956. So two neighbors, neighborhoods you might know about, the Flats and Chicken Ridge, they're nice neighborhoods. But as code has modernized, the houses have stayed the same. And modern standards tend towards larger lots with larger setbacks. So when these homeowners wanted to upgrade their homes, say they wanted to build a bump out so they could expand their kitchen, or maybe they wanted to put a cover around their fireplace flue, they would need to go to the Planning Commission to get a variance. And a variance is explicit permission to not follow the law in a very certain circumstance. And this worked well until about 2015 when the assembly heard an appeal that is now called the Olmo decision. And with that appeal and with the case law that supported it, uh, it was established that before a variance could be issued, hardships had to be established. In other words, if you're gonna break the rules, you need to do it for a really good reason. And hardship in land ownership has a very specific definition. It is the inability to use land like your neighbors in other words, it denies reasonable use of the property. Well, the fact that in downtown, you have residents living in dense neighborhoods that are well-established kind of illustrates that the property is being used as intended. Also, hardship must be based on peculiarities of the land itself. It cannot be man-made. So something like a rock outcropping or a stream. So establishing hardship is a particular challenge for downtown. Uh, I'll start with talking about setbacks. A setback is the distance between the finished side of the building and the lot line. And so between 1987 and 2015, 80% of the variances issued for downtown were for setbacks. And the fact that they were approved by the commission indicates that in the eyes of the community, they were reasonable improvements. So while 80% of downtown variances were for setbacks, the average borough wide was about 50%. So there seemed to be an inordinate impact on our neighbors downtown. So city leaders did two things. One is that they changed the definition of peculiarities from extraordinary situation or unique physical feature to an unusual or special situation. So while that relaxation helped borough-wide, it still left our downtown neighbors in a difficult situation. When there are well-established neighborhoods, it's hard to argue that any lot has an unusual or special condition. So they established hastily the Alternative Development Overlay District, or ADOD. And for the folks in this area, and the map is on your screen, and you can see the heavy black line there outlining the area where it applies, they created special structure setback rules to recognize a special situation. And here's how it works. Uh, so you see in the middle of this picture this aqua lot. Uh, the owners were interested in having a side yard setback reduction. So what we did is we looked at the residential structures within 150 feet and measured their side yard setbacks, averaged them, and then that became the established setback for the aqua lot. There's some challenges with this methodology. One is that the GIS imagery and the GIS lot lines don't line up perfectly. Uh, another one is you can see that there's some vegetation, there's some shadow. So how the technician does the measuring can impact what the measurement is. And so one way we've addressed this here at Community Development is we have one person, our GIS technician, do it so at least we have that one person doing it consistently. 
And then finally, some of these homes have as-built. An as-built is a very accurate map done by a surveyor showing where the structures are. Well, do you use the more accurate information or do you use the more consistent information? And so what you end up here with is that good people trying to do the right thing can come up with different answers and that, that is not a good thing. It does not serve equity. The other thing, as you can imagine, it takes time. Not only do you have the staff work, but this has to go to the planning commission. That's at least eight weeks from your application, probably more like 16. And the fee for this is $400 per lot line. So a relatively expensive development option. Nonetheless, we've had about 12 of these uh, since inception on eight properties. And here's how they've been used. Here's an example on 11th Street where this structure they made a bump out on the second and third floors to expand the residential area of the house. Here's one on 12th Street. This is the uh, fireplace I was telling you about. These folks wanted to put a gas fireplace in their living room. And you can see where they took off some of the siding there. That's where they were going to put the exhaust and a chase, basically a cover that goes around it. And in the overhead picture on the left, you can see uh, that we have this feature here, this cover over the basement window kind of shows you what the visual impact of this proposed chase in the dark black would be. So that was the one that was approved. This one's a little bit more complex. Here you have a home on a triangular lot. This part is the home, this part is the garage. And they wanted to do an expansion off what, let's call it the back lot would be. But in order to make this expansion of 272 square feet, they needed to reduce their setback from 13 feet to 10 feet. So that's something we were able to do with the ADOD. These folks bought a very cute little miner's cottage that needed a lot of work. And so one of the things they wanted to do was enclose the front porch here. So they were able to do that. When they did that, they were also able to move some of the structural parts that were actually encroaching into CBJ property. So definitely a win-win on this one. And our final example, this lot, it's 1,257 square feet, a little lot. So how do you put a house on that? You reduce the setbacks. And so we use the ADOD to reduce the setbacks so that the structure that is shown on the right-hand side of your screen could be built. So that's the existing ADOT. So from here on out, let's be very lucid about a couple of terms. The existing ADOT is in place now, the one we just talked about. That's the one where you uh, examine properties within 150 feet. This one expires August 1st, 2022, which is right around the corner from when this is being recorded. And then we have the proposed ADOD. That's the one we would like to replace this with. We'll be talking about it now. And when looking at the new ADOD, staff aimed for something that was faster with more explicit standards. And the current proposal is that we don't charge anything for it. The proposal that you're gonna see is very similar to the analysis that we already do for any other building permit. So this increases the speed and reduces the cost. Now when I go through it, I'm gonna go through it in the order in which topics occur in the proposed ordinance. So you can follow along if you are so inclined. But first let's start with looking at the map. So on the left you have the ADOT as it stands now. And on the right, you have the proposed ADOT. And you'll notice that here where we have MU and MU2 zoning, those areas have been removed from the ADOT. That's because MU and MU2 have very forgiving standards. In MU, the, uh, the setback is zero, and there's no height limit. In MU2, the setback is five feet, and there's more forgiving height than you find in the ADOT. So we figured you weren't getting much bang for your buck in those areas. So the new ADOD is in the residential, mostly in the residential districts with a little bit of light commercial. And just to kind of bring that to your attention where these things are, because what we're gonna do is we're gonna compare existing zoning districts to what's proposed in the ADOD. So when you look at D5, that's what we have here in the flats. D18 and D10, those are denser, so that's in the upper part of downtown. First thing let's look at is lot size. And so you'll notice the proposed ADOT is 3,000 square feet for a single family home or for a common wall. 
A common wall is where you have two autonomous homes that just happen to share a wall. That's the only thing they share. And then we have a proposed 4,500 square feet for a duplex. The duplex has shared elements. They might share a driveway, share a garage, maybe share laundry facilities. Perhaps the dwelling units are on top of each other. So that's the difference between a common wall and a duplex. Notice that the ADOT is less than we have it for our existing zoning lot sizes. Also that the duplex size, how we got that in our current zoning is you multiplied the single family home size by 1.5 and we did that here too with the ADOT. So we go 3,000 for the single family home, 4,500 for the duplex. Okay, so where did the Planning Commission get this 3,000 square foot opening position? They looked at all the properties in downtown and considered conformity, which means it is developed in accordance with current rules. Non-conforming means that it doesn't meet current rules, but it met the rules at the time it was built. So what the commission was looking at is like, how many properties would be made conforming for lot size if we had the 3,000 square feet? And it looks like 78% and we have a jump there from 72 to 78%. And they felt like that was representative of the development scale that's going on in downtown, that would be compatible with the existing development scale. They felt like 3,500 was a little too big, 2,500 was a little too small. So this brings up the question, how many properties could be subdivided downtown? This map shows you the lots in downtown that are 6,000 square feet or more. In other words, that could be subdivided. This is only based on lot size. There's other things to consider. One, can the existing structures meet setbacks? Uh, two, what are the access provisions? That sort of thing. So there's a couple of things uh, that might make these not subdividable. But just based on size, these are the ones you could consider. Also note the blue line. The Lots above the blue line are in a severe hazard area and cannot be subdivided because at this time under current code, we do not increase density in a severe hazard area. Okay, so width lot size, lot width establishes your lot dimensions. You can see there's a difference between what we currently have in our zoning districts and what's proposed. ADOD, we're looking at a 25 foot minimum lot width um, and in our existing residential zoning districts, we're looking at from 70 feet to 50 feet. So why did the commission go so low at 25 feet? One was to meet current conditions and one was to provide flexibility in lot shape. To meet current conditions, uh, to give you an idea of lot width down in the flat, tends to be about 40 feet. Uh, in the Chicken Ridge area, especially on Kennedy and Nelson, there's some lots that are about 25 feet wide. A couple that are less. Um, if lot width had remained unchanged, if we were, for instance, in D5 stuck with a 70-foot lot width, given lot area and lot width, we would end up with square or rectangular lots. And the commission felt like when we're looking at infill, we might need to be a little bit more creative with the shape of the lots that we're looking at. Okay, and so with the 3,000 square foot lot and a 25 foot width, one developer had expressed concern with the ability to meet vegetative cover requirements in the 20 to 30 percent range. Uh, so the commission is proposing 15 percent. Uh, they're also working on companion code that will clarify the role of vegetative cover in drainage and filtering. And that companion code would allow features like permeable pavement to count towards your vegetative cover. However, today, when you're looking at this, vegetative cover is plants in the ground. Structure height has basically stayed the same for most of the zoning districts you'll find in downtown. Since the ADOT is a residential tool, we stuck with residential heights. So in our existing and proposed ADOD, uh, permissible uses have a height limit of 35 feet. That'd be like your, your primary residence. An accessory use has a height of 25 feet. That would be something like a, a garage or a shop that was removed from the building. Now notice that if you're in a light commercial, if you want to participate in the ADOD, you're going to be sacrificing a little bit of your height capability. OK, 
hey, setbacks. This is interesting. Um, and it's been well received. We've got what we're calling the floating setback box. So just as a reminder, a setback is the distance from the finished side of a building to the lot line. And under current code, setbacks from lot lines are fixed. Uh, so for instance, in D5, uh, the front setback is 20 feet, the rear setback is 20 feet, and the side yard setback would be five feet. Under the proposed ADOD, we've established what we call the floating box. And basically, the sum of your setbacks has to be 20 feet, and the minimum from the lot line is three feet. So buildings, how we came up with that three foot figure, buildings closer than six feet to each other need to meet special fire separation construction standards. So that's where the three feet came from. We just split it down the middle. And so here on the left, you can see, here is a setback box that is centered. It's got five foot setbacks on all sides. Uh, on the right, you see that the bottom setback is three feet. So they needed to make up two feet somewhere. And in this certain circumstance, they put, uh, they added two feet to the rear setback to make seven feet. So your development needs to happen within your floating setback box. So whatever you're building, it needs to stay in the box. But it does give footprint flexibility while still accommodating light and air between structures. Okay. The next section in the code is exceptions. It looks a little overwhelming, but I'm going to summarize it for you in a way that I think is easy. We have some common sense exceptions in current code, and we've moved them over to the ADOD to clarify that they also apply in the ADOD. So for instance, if you have a walkway that comes up to the lot line, like we do in this first picture on the left, um, it makes no sense to require a setback. It would interfere with the function of that structure. So there's an exemption for walkways and stairways that go to the front lot line. As you can see in the middle picture, there's also an exemption for a parking deck that needs to go up to the front line. And we also, uh, brought over standards for obstructions on corner lots. Again, this is code that already exists, but we brought it over to the ADOD to clarify that it still applies under the ADOD. Of note, the public had a lot of interest in obstructions on corner lots. And the Commission and Law Department had made an attempt to improve on the standards that we have existing, but it got very complex very fast. So rather than delay the ADOD further, they determined that they're putting the issue of corner lot obstructions on their to-do list. So as we discussed, you can't mix and match. If you want to go with the ADOD, you will need to stick with the ADOD standards. And where that is tricky is where somebody might have some advantages in their underlying zoning. So let's say you have a residence in light commercial. You can't say, oh, I want my 2,000 foot lot size, I want three foot setbacks, and I want my 45 foot height. You have to choose one or the other. Now, note that nobody is going to be forced to use the ADOD in order to make them conform. If someone sees advantage to keeping their current zoning, they can get what's called a non-conforming certification. And basically, that allows them to keep what they have, but future development would have to meet the standards of their underlying zoning. So there's a summary for you. Uh, lot size for a single family home, 3,000 square feet. Lot width, 25 feet. Vegetative cover, we're looking at 15%. Structure height is 35 feet for permissible uses and 25 feet for accessory use, uses. Uh, setbacks, you have a minimum of three feet and a total of 20 feet required. We have carried over exemptions for access and architectural features that go to the front of the lot, and corner lot obstructions remain the same. So if you have questions, if you're an assembly member, please contact Jill McLean, our director. And if you're a member of the public, feel free to contact me. Members of the public might say, why do the assembly members get special treatment? Well, they've got special rules. When they're going to make a decision about something, we want to be careful that it's very transparent what information they're basing their decision on. So we want to make sure that that's consistently delivered to them. Now, uh, before we go, I'd like to show you where to find the record if you want it. If you're not interested, you can go ahead and bug out now. Uh, otherwise, if you hold on for just a minute, I will take you over to our website and show you
what we are going to, where we can find that information. Okay, folks, here we are at CDJ's website. You just go over to Departments and find Community Development. Look for Special Projects. And then go to short-term projects over here on the right. And the very first button you have here is for the Alternative Development Overlay District. And when you hit the plus bar, you see um, we've got the next event. We've got a copy of current material. And then we have the record. And it's about 19 meetings over four years, so it's pretty extensive. If you go and look at the record, the order of the documents in it would be if the commission made a document, for instance, a notice of decision, that's on the top. The next item would be if materials from staff and the public. And then the last thing would be, if they're available, minutes from the meetings. That's it. Folks, I think this is going to be on CBJ's uh, YouTube channel. So if this is a good way for you to receive information, smash the like button. Otherwise, I will be seeing you at the meeting.